Okay, let's talk about uh, surface area of parametric surfaces as well as scalar surface integrals. Uh, this topic is something that you can uh, understand as soon as you can work with double integrals and as soon as you are reasonably familiar with uh, parametric surfaces. It's a topic that is sometimes delayed until close to the end of a calculus course because it can be used to lead up to the surface integral of vector fields because the visualizations are similar. Independent of where you're at, as long as you have these two prerequisites, double integrals as well as a reasonable understanding of parametric surfaces, this ought to work for you and we've got plenty of computations in here. So, basically, to understand where the for formula is coming from, we have to remember that in parametric surfaces, rectangles are mapped to approximate parallelograms. So let's just take a look one more time at an animation that builds a parametric surface, right? We've got a domain that is being mapped to a surface and what happens is that horizontal lines in the domain become coordinate lines in the surface, vertical lines become uh, corresponding coordinate lines and then ultimately the lines in the domain form a mesh, a grid uh, a coordinate grid, if you will, on the parametric surface. And what happens is that these squares, or if you were to distort it a little bit, rectangles, are mapped to, because the surface doesn't necessarily preserve the angles, to uh, little pieces that are approximate parallelograms. Of course, they are warped in the third dimension, so they're, they're bent in space, as well as just having angles that aren't necessarily right angles. But overall, they are very close to being parallelograms, and as we know from calculus, if we were to make this mesh arbitrarily fine, then these approximate parallelograms really would be virtually indistinguishable from parallelograms, and therefore we could compute their area. And so the idea for the surface area formula is that we compute the areas of these little parallelograms, and we know how to do that because that's the magnitude of the appropriate cross product, and then we just add all those little areas up. And that is exactly how we derive the formula. So let's take a look at a parametric surface where we have a uh, parameter domain uv that sits right here. And then a function surface of u and v that maps this domain to this sheet in space that is the parametric surface. Then we know that horizontal lines in the domain turn into coordinate lines v equals constant on the surface. Vertical lines in the domain turn into coordinate lines u equals constant on the surface and we can already see that uh, because of course that's how I wanted it to look uh, that these intersections then in the parameter domain become little rectangles and the corresponding intersection becomes certainly a distorted rectangle right I mean this thing is has bent sides and the angle um, you'd have you'd need to use a little bit of goodwill to assume that this is a right angle and in fact I don't want these things to look like right angles here. So what we then have is in the parameter domain we have a little area dA that has horizontal extent du and vertical extent dv. What's the corresponding extent in or, or on the parametric surface? Well if I take a step in the u direction then basically I have a step du here that is however magnified by the vector ds du, right? So this is ds du times du, that's a little step in the u direction here, and that is in fact the exact corresponding vector to this vector du here. It is not exactly going along, the, along this coordinate line, but it is very, very close. And so basically this is then, of course, the partial derivative of, if we hold v constant, this is the derivative of just a, a vector-valued function. Similarly, the dv... Well, if we take a small step in the v direction, then that turns into a step in the blue direction here, and that would be a step ds dv times dv, because the ds dv gives us the tangent line to this blue curve, and the dv tells us how far we step along that tangent line in that direction. And again, that aligns very nicely with this approximate parallelogram. We know, and we can also see that it is not exactly a parallelogram and again we can use what we know about calculus that if we were to make this mesh finer and finer then the parallelogram that is spanned by ds du 
times du and ds dv times dv would be closer and closer to this actual little patch on that surface. What that means, however, is that this little area ds is equal to the area of the parallelogram. The area of the parallelogram is the cross product of this vector with this vector, or, or is, is the magnitude of the cross product of this uh, of these two vectors, and if, since it's a magnitude, we can just take ds du du cross ds dv dv, and then take the magnitude, and dv, du and dv are both scalars, so those come out, so really this surface element here is ds being the magnitude of ds du cross ds dv times du times dv, and to get the whole surface, or at least an approximation to the whole surface, we would now have to add up the area of all the patches that we get from all the intersections of pairs of coordinate lines and if we then take the limit then this becomes an integral and so we obtain the following definition the surface integral of a smooth parametric surface smooth just means you've got uh, sufficient differentiability conditions you want to have a continuous derivative so uh, the surface area of a smooth parametric surface s of u and v with a smaller equal u smaller equal b and c smaller equal u smaller equal d is a being integral from a to b integral from c to d ds du cross ds dv dv du and uh, that comes directly from this derivation we've got a square domain and so if in the u direction it goes from a to b and in the v direction it goes from c to d then of course we have to sum from a to b and from c to d uh, and what we sum is all these little area elements here. Now if the parametric surface has a non-rectangular domain then the surface area is the double integral over the domain ds du cross ds dv times dA and that's because the dv du will become our area element. The derivation then of course is that we take whatever shape area element we have here and those area elements are being distorted into things that again are sort of like distorted rectangles and the distortion factor is again ds du cross ds dv magnitude. Okay, so now we're going to look at examples and it's, it's really pretty much computation from here on out. It's just that the computations take a little bit longer. So if I want to compute the surface area of the surface parameterized by the function s of u and v being u cosine v, u sine v and v with u smaller u between 0 and 1 and v between 0 and 6 pi well note that this thing is, is sort of round but it's not a cylinder it would be a cylinder if this was a was a u here but it's a v and so even though of course you know that I, I always preach visualization this is one where I actually don't want us to visualize at this stage because I want us to first fully appreciate the power of calculus that tells us that if we just understand the formulas and apply them correctly we can get the result even when the visualization is too difficult for geometry and maybe even for mental things. Now of course as a nice exercise that you can do maybe stop the presentation before we come to the end when we actually show the picture you could certainly try to tell try to ask your mind tell me what that actually looks like. It's a pretty neat visualization but in terms of computing the surface area it's just computation. We know the formula. We know what to do. We have the parametrization, we have the parameter domain, so we just have to take the partials, take the cross product, take the magnitude of that, and then integrate. And so that would mean we take the partial of s with respect to u. Well, that's a partial with respect to u of u cosine v, u sine v, and v, which would be cosine v, sine v, and 0. And that's right here. We need the partial of s with respect to v, which is the partial with respect to v of u cosine v, u sine v, and v which would be negative u sine v, u cosine v, and 1. And then we need the cross product of these two partials. So we need the cross product of cosine v, sine v, and 0, cross negative u sine v, u cosine v, and 1, and then take the magnitude of that. And so that is, well, let's just see, cross product sine v times 1 minus u cosine v times 0 is sine v. Then we have a negative sign out front, negative cosine v times 1, minus, minus, or so double negative, but either way, uh, negative u 
sine v times 0, which means it doesn't really matter because we multiplied by 0. So that gives us negative cosine v in the second component. And for the third component, we get u cosine squared v right here, minus minus, so plus u sine squared v here. And when we take the magnitude of that, well, first let's simplify sine v stays, negative cosine v stays. u cosine squared v plus u sine squared v is, of course, just u. Take the magnitude of that, we get the square root of sine squared v from here, plus cosine squared v from here. I already dropped the negative sign since the square will erase it anyway. Plus u squared right here. Sine squared v plus cosine squared v is 1, so this is the square root of 1 plus u squared. And that means our area is the integral from a to b and from c to d of the partial of s with respect to u cross the partial of s with respect to v magnitude dv du. We already know what this is. This is the integral from 0 to 1 in u, because that's from where to where u goes. v goes from 0 to 6 pi, so we get the integral from 0 to 6 pi dv. And we have that the integrand is supposed to be square root of 1 plus u squared. And then, of course, the v integral just gives us a 6 pi. We are left with the integral from 0 to 1 of square root 1 plus u squared. That is something that I think with enough patience and a little bit of work with hyperbolic uh, hyperbolic trigonometric functions you can work out, but I would say realistically this is something where you want to use an integral table or a computer algebra system. And here's the answer. So the antiderivative, okay, the 6 pi stays, and the antiderivative of square root 1 plus u squared is u half square root u squared plus 1 plus 1 half ln u plus square root u squared plus 1. And uh, yeah, that's already telling us that that computation takes a while. It can be done, but it takes a while. Either way, we have to plug in 1 and we have to plug in 0 in this one. And so let's see, if we plug in 1, we end up with root 2 over 2 from here. We end up with 1 half ln 1 plus root 2 here. And if we plug in 0, we end up with 0 plus 1 half ln 1, which is 0 also. So we just have 6 pi. 1 half root 2 plus 1 half times ln 1 plus root 2, and that's approximately 21.6354. Okay, so that is the answer. That's the number. What does that thing actually look like? Well, it is actually a spiral staircase because what we have is cosine v and sine v basically give us a direction of the z axis, and the u just then draws a ray from length 0 to length 1 in that direction. And so that ray is now on one hand rotating around with cosine v sine v and on the other hand it is being moved up with the z component and so that gives us this well it's it's not a spiral staircase because so, those things aren't stairs it's a spiral ramp if you will or a corkscrew. And that certainly also tells us that this one is complicated enough that I really wouldn't want to use geometry to figure out the area. Um, and in fact, if we look at the exact answer, it, it feels like geometry would be quite hopeless. I, I apologize to anybody who is more versed in geometry if there actually is a way to do this with geometry. But certainly the point of this first rather technical or rather, rather ugly computational example is to show that the formulas give us access to surfaces that I think we would have little hope to work with in, in any other way. All right, so now let's move on. And of course, I mean, the other thing is, even though the computation took some time, this is certainly a pretty natural and quite beautiful surface, and we can find the area of that thing with the calculus formula. Now, there are other things we can do, such as, for example, we can compute the surface area of a cap of height h of a surface of radius, of a sphere of radius a. So basically, a standard example is to compute the surface area of a sphere. Well, we know what the surface area of, this, of a sphere is. It is 4 pi a squared. And so let's just take a look at what happens when we take a sphere, but we only want to take the surface area of this little blue cap here. right? If we want to compute the surface area of that thing, it's best to look at a cross section. And so the cross section of the sphere would certainly be a circle. And the cap then is just this little cutoff from the circle here. The cap has height h, and that means if the full radius of the circle is a, then this length here is a minus h. 
um, and of course it would actually have to be h minus a but I, I'm just looking at scalars here right now it's not coordinates it's just scalar lengths this length is a because that's the radius and of course when we work with spheres ultimately we're going to use parametrizations that are parametrizations of the sphere which are similar to spherical coordinates so we will ultimately deal with angles that come off the vertical axis and so uh, and we'll talk about that angle in just a second so on one hand here by Pythagoras this length then this upper radius of the cap is the square root of a squared minus a minus h quantity squared and then we have this angle which I'm going to call VL which just ends up being this angle right here because that's the angle or parameter that ultimately corresponds to where this cap ends and so if we're looking at the parametrization of a sphere well the parametrization of a sphere is radius times cosine u sine v radius times sine u sine v and radius times cosine v which is basically spherical coordinates except that this time the radius is a constant and well we will need to know what v sub l is and if we want to look at that well this angle can be obtained as the arc tangent of negative uh, negative a over a negative a minus h would be this um, this length here because the tangent of an angle of course is opposite over adjacent and uh, we would just place the angle right here so uh, we would have that the adjacent side is negative a minus h so that's the negative a minus h here and then the opposite side is square root of a squared minus a minus h quantity squared which after you multiply out the parentheses you realize that a squared minus a squared goes away minus minus 2ah gives us the 2ah and minus h squared gives us the minus h squared here so basically we are working this out with um, what would be polar coordinates but polar coordinates coming off the vertical axis in this case and of course if that's the case then to actually get this angle correct we would have to add pi to it because potentially we're well in in both cases here we're actually sitting well in um, if we count quadrants off the vertical axis and we've got first second third fourth quadrant and so if we're sitting in the third quadrant we would actually have to add pi to it that's not going to be a problem because and bear with me here basically what I know is the tangent of VL is this thing and what we actually will need is the cosine of VL and we will see that in the computation and the cosine of VL is the negative cosine of pi minus VL okay VL comes off here pi minus VL is here and we know that the cosine of an angle is negative the cosine of pi minus that angle that's a quick trig identity and uh, the negative cosine of pi minus VL will be negative this one over that one so ah, <laughs> cosine is adjacent over over hypotenuse so it would be negative a minus h divided by a which we have here and that turns out to be just h minus a over a okay so let's see what we can do with that because the rest now really is just computation now we use the formula all of this encodes the right visualizations that we need so we need dsdu cross dsdv magnitude right because we want to compute the surface area and this is the surface area factor if you will so that means we need the derivative with respect to u of a cosine u sine v a sine u sine v a cosine v cross the derivative with respect to v a cosine u sine v a sine u sine v a cosine v and uh, well yes yeah, so that means that here we get negative a sine u sine v a cosine u sine v and 0 for the first one and for the second one we get a cosine u cosine v a sine u cosine v and negative a sine v for the v derivative and now we work out the cross product well that would give us uh, and I think I've just written it all out yeah so that would give us a cosine u sine v times negative a sine v right here times this thing times zeros uh, or minus this thing times zero so minus zero 
Then we have for the middle component the extra negative sign that we always have to be careful with. And we have negative a sine u sine v times negative a sine v right here. Minus a cosine u cosine v times 0, so that's just minus 0. And for the z component we have negative a sine u sine v times negative a sine v, which ends up being... There's an extra negative sign right now that I don't quite see. Hang on just a second. Okay, there was an extra negative sign there because I, I slipped into the wrong row. For the third component, we take negative a sine u sine v times a sine u cosine v. And so that would give us negative a sine u sine v, a sine u cosine v. And then minus a cosine u cosine v, a cosine u cosine v times a cosine u sine v, which is right here. So all of this is correct, and now we just start simplifying a bit. And so, for example, in the first component, we get a negative a squared cosine u sine squared v. Okay, here we are. And when we simplify that, I'm already taking the magnitude here. Okay, so first component is a squared cosine u sine squared v with an extra negative sign. If we square that, we get a squared squared, which is a to the fourth cosine u squared is cosine squared, and sine squared v squared again is sine to the fourth v, and at the end of this we're going to take everything to the one half to get the magnitude. For the magnitude we get, well, minus, 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 okay, it doesn't matter because this component is being squared also, we get a squared squared is a to the fourth, we get sine u squared is sine squared u, we get sine squared v squared is sine to the fourth v, and for the last one, we just get whatever that is squared, and then we have the one half here from the magnitude. So here we just sort. We get uh, a squared, then we get sine squared u, we get sine v cosine v, we have a squared cosine squared u sine v cosine v, and you wonder where the negative signs went? Well, we have minus and minus here, and since the whole thing is being squared for the magnitude, I can just uh, cancel that negative sign already. Okay, so now let's combine that a little bit. We have a to the fourth sine to the fourth v here as well as here, and so that means that this sine squared of u plus this cosine squared of u gives us 1, and so in the next row we have a to the fourth sine squared v, that is the sum of all these guys here, that's just this a to the fourth sine to the fourth v here. And for the other one, we have a squared sine v cosine v, a squared sine v cosine v, and so here this cosine squared u and this sine squared u add up to 1, and we end up with the whole thing just being a to the fourth sine squared v cosine squared v, and then of course we still have the square root that we have to take overall. Well, can we simplify that some more? We actually can, because sine to the fourth v is just sine squared v times sine squared v, right? That's the only thing that changed, otherwise I just have copied everything else. And, uh, well, now sine squared v plus cosine squared v is 1, and the a to the fourth sine squared v is a common factor out front for both, so this is just a to the fourth sine squared v to the one half, and that ends up being a squared sine v, and because the parameter v ranges from 0 to pi, we don't have to worry about absolute values or anything like that. We can just uh, take the square root and not have to worry about an absolute value around the sign. So this is our integrand, which is nice, because that means that the surface area will be the integral from vl to pi, right, because in this picture that we had, our angle that comes off the vertical axis has to go from this starting angle all the way down to the negative vertical axis, and uh, our parameter u, which goes around, which is basically an angle that rotates around the vertical axis, has to go from 0 to 2 pi. We have to integrate a squared sine v du dv, and that's about as easy as it comes, right? It's a squared integral from 0 to pi d, from 0 to 2 pi du, integral from vl to pi sine of v dv. And so that's a squared, copied. Integral from 0 to 2 pi du is just 2 pi, 
antiderivative of sine of v is negative cosine v, and so we get negative cosine pi minus negative cosine of vl, so plus cosine of vl. And this cosine of vl is the reason why I said at the beginning we need to know the cosine of vl, because of course the negative cosine of pi is 1. And so we have 2 pi a squared from the front, negative cosine of pi is 1, and the cosine of vl was h minus a divided by a. If you work that out, you realize that minus a over a is negative 1, so 1 minus 1 goes away, and you end up with 2 pi a squared h over a, which is 2 pi a h, and that is the surface area of a cap of height h of a sphere of radius a, which is a very natural object certainty of which we would like to know the surface area. And as a quick sanity check, for h equals 2a, so if the cap has height twice the radius, remember that the height was counted from the bottom, which means if the height is twice the radius, if the height is the full diameter of the sphere, then we actually need to get the surface area of the whole sphere. And we do, because for h equals 2a, we end up with 4 pi a squared, as we should for the surface area of a sphere. Uh, this should be the final example, which then leads over into a few formulas. I want us to compute the area of the part of the paraboloid z equals 9 minus x squared minus y squared that lies above the xy plane. Now, when you have a surface of the form z equals f of xy, there are formulas that give you that surface area, but these formulas are derived from the formula that we already have, and so I personally prefer to just rederive that even in the computations because it isn't that hard. So the surface of x and y that we would get for this thing, the parametric surface would be x, y, and then we just put whatever we have for z into the z component, right? That means, and we want to have that z is greater or equal than zero because it's supposed to lie above the xy plane. And z greater or equal than 0, therefore, means that 9 minus x squared minus y squared is greater or equal than 0. And that means that x squared plus y squared is less than or equal than 9. So this is a circle of radius 3. The rest, therefore, now is just computation, because now we have a, sur we have a parametric surface. We know what the domain is. The domain is not a rectangle. Well, so what? The rectangle is the domain is a circle, which means we can use polar coordinates to integrate over that circle, so that's not going to give us any trouble. And other than that, we just use the formulas that we already have. So if we look at ds dx cross ds dy magnitude, that'll be the partial derivative with respect to x of xy 9 minus x squared minus y squared cross the partial derivative with respect to y of xy 9 minus x squared minus y squared. And if we do that, well, partial with respect to x of x is 1, partial with respect to x of y is 0, partial with respect to x of 9 minus x squared minus y squared is negative 2x, partial with respect to y of x is 0, partial with respect to y of y is 1, partial with respect to y of 9 minus x squared minus y squared is negative 2y. Now we form the cross product. What do we get? We get minus minus 2x for the x component, so 2x in the x component we get minus minus 2y uh, minus 0 for the y component, so 2y for the y component, and 1 minus 0 for the z component, so 1 for the z component. So what, what you notice here, and that's ultimately what those formulas observe, is that these are the negative partial derivatives of the function, and this thing will always be 1. But as I said, uh, rederiving that doesn't take too long and, and, econom and it economizes on memory. If you wish to memorize the formulas that we're going to derive in uh, right after this example, perfectly fine with me. It's just that that's just not the way I function typically. All right, so the magnitude of 2x, 2y, and 1 is, of course, just the square root of 1 plus 4x squared plus 4y squared. And now we can compute because the area is the integral or the double integral over the domain, which is x squared plus y squared smaller equal than 9, of square root 1 plus 4x squared plus 4y squared. That's the, uh, the, the scaling factor, dA. And so that's, if we go to polar coordinates, that's that the radius goes from 0 to 3. Our angle goes from 0 to 2 pi. Of square root of 1 plus 4x squared plus 4y squared, well, x squared plus y squared is r squared, so this here is just 4 
r squared, so this is square root of 1 plus 4 r squared, and then we multiply with the polar area element, which is r d theta dr. And if we work that out, I think the first thing that happens is that, of course, the d theta integral is just 2 pi, and that means we have 2 pi integral from 0 to 3 square root 1 plus 4 r squared times r dr. This integral is solved with a quick substitution u equals 1 plus 4 r squared du dr will be 8 r. That means that uh, dr is du over 8 r and that means we get a factor 1 8 extra there. And so then if you work that out uh, with the other extra factors that we are getting because when we integrate u to the one half, we get an extra factor two thirds. Well, two thirds times one eighth is one twelfth, and then we have antiderivative giving us uh, whatever is inside to the three halves, and whatever was inside was the one plus four r squared from zero to three. Okay, so this is something that uh, if that went a little too fast for you, do the steps that I just verbalized in writing. There is no penalty for that. Uh, it is just something where you want to train your mind to be able to fit in these kinds of steps for computations because when you see them in an advanced text, usually the expectation will be that you fill in those steps yourself. Once we have that, of course, we plug in 0 and 3 and we get some ungodly number. Um, I apologize for using <laughs> the name of the Lord in vain there, but the number really isn't that pretty, namely... We, get, we keep the 2 pi, we keep the 1 twelfth. At 3, we get 3 squared, which is 9, times 4 is 36, plus 1 is 37. So 1 twelfth, 1 twelfth, 37 to the 3 halves, and then minus 1 twelfth times 1 to the 3 halves, because at 0, we actually get 1 here. And so that's pi over 6, 37 over 37 to the 3 halves, minus 1, which is approximately 117.318. Seven, and if we look at it, here is the surface, and it's another one of those surfaces that is certainly something where if there is a geometrically derived formula, I am not sure how that geometry would work. And the power of calculus is, of course, that we don't need the geometric reasoning. We need a certain amount of geometric visualization to be able to set up the parametrization. But once we have that, everything else is computation, and that is really well that way. All right, so as promised, uh, for the parametric representation, s of that should be s of x and y, not s of t. Let me fix that real quick. And we're back. Well, okay, so now the parametric representation is surface of x and y being x, y, g of x, y of a surface z equals g of x, y. Well, we have that partial of s with respect to x cross partial of s with respect to y is negative the x partial of g, negative the y partial of g in the y component, and 1 in the z component. And as I have also said in our presentation on the parametric surfaces, uh, this is very much a standard way to turn a function into a parametric surface. And as long as we understand that, we wouldn't need to remember too many specific formulas, and that is the route that I choose to take personally. Uh, here, this proposition actually is only going to be a lemma for something else that we're going to derive, but first let's prove this. Well, s sub x cross s sub y would be the x partial of x, y, g of x, y, cross the y partial of x, y, g of x, y, which will be 1, 0, partial g with respect to y, 0, 1, partial g with respect to x, right? 1, 0, dg, dx, cross 0, 1, uh, dg, dy. And if we take the cross product of that, we get 0 minus dg, dx, negative, negative dg, dy, dy minus 0, and 1 minus 0. And that's exactly what we have here. So that proves this proposition already. And uh, when we have that, we can certainly say that if g of x, y is a function of two variables, where x is between a and b and c is between uh, y is between c and d, then the surface area of the graph of that function, which is, an, again, something natural to think about, that surface area is the integral from a to b and from c to d of square root 1 plus partial g with respect to x squared plus partial g with respect to y squared 
dy dx. Well, that is a consequence of the surface area formula that we already have derived earlier on, because the proof simply says that a will have to be the integral of the standard parameterization partial with respect to x cross the standard parameterization partial with respect to y magnitude dy dx and we know that that would be the integral of the magnitude of this vector and now it is the magnitude I apologize for that well and so the magnitude of that is of course just that we keep the integral from a to b and from c to d dy dx and the magnitude is 1 squared if we just go and put the z coordinate first and then partial g with respect to x squared from here and partial g with respect to y squared from here and so that means this is a formula that people sometimes use directly there is of course no problem in doing so the only problem is we would actually have to remember the formula and with the derivation being fairly simple going back to the standard parameterization I personally always go back to the fundamental formula for the parametric surfaces Okay, so finally the scalar surface integral. Well, the surface integral of a function over a surface would be that we would want to summarize values of the function at points on a little surface element on one of those little almost, uh, almost parallelograms that we have times the area of the parallelogram. And so this is something where we could again just do a whole derivation with Riemann sums, but basically the idea is that the surface integral of a function over the surface S parameterized by S of u and v over the domain D ultimately ends up being the surface integral of F dS being the integral over the domain F of S of u and v times the uh, surface area formula S u cross S v magnitude times the area element for the parametrization. The surface integral can be visualized and can be used to compute for example the mass of a two-dimensional density that is distributed in three-dimensional space such as I don't know sheet metal of varying thickness or so that is modeled just as a surface or sheet metal that is made up of different materials as, as you go across space uh, but it, it, is, it becomes something where uh, as far as I can see certainly it's it's quite hard to, to sell this integral except ultimately in its connection to the surface integral of vector fields which we'll also talk about so right now we're just going to use this as a definition it seems to make sense that if we attach weight factors which is basically what these things are weight factors or density factors to various areas of the surface that the integral ought to be that you take your scaling factors and multiply them with the appropriate area element which would be the scaling factor times the area element of the parametrization and if the surface is given by a function z equals g of x y well then the integral is just the same thing only that you use the area element that we have just derived so it would be the integral of f of x y g of x y times square root of 1 plus partial of g with respect to x squared plus partial of g with respect to y quantity squared dA and if we want to compute the surface integral of a function f of xyz being xyz over a quarter cone u cosine v u sine v and u where u goes from 0 to 1 and v goes from 0 to pi over 2 well it's straight computation we know what to do namely we take the s partial of our uh, of our quarter cone which uh, we take the u partial of our quarter cone which would be the partial with respect to u of u cosine v u sine v and u and uh, well that gives us cosine v sine v and, and 1 and uh, the v partial would be partial with respect to v of u cosine v u sine v and u which would give us negative u sine v u cosine v and 0 and uh, then we work out the cross product of those two so that's the cross product of cosine v sine v and 1 cross negative u sine v u cosine v and 0 exactly the cross product of these two vectors up here and so what would we get we would get 0 minus u cosine v we would get 0 minus negative u sine v times 1 so that would ultimately end up being uh, negative u sine v and I think I have an extra negative sign here or not let's think that through real quick for the first one 
that negative u cosine v is correct because we subtract cosine v and then we have minus negative u sine v. There's an extra negative sign there because of course the second component has to have an extra negative sign so I think that ought to be negative here, no problem, that can be fixed. And now it is fixed. Sorry about missing that negative sign here, but that was one negative sign from here, one negative sign from the subtraction, and one negative sign extra from the fact that this is a second component. And in the end, actually, it won't matter because we're going to square that thing, right? Uh, third component, well, cosine v, u cosine v gives us u cosine squared v, minus negative u sine v times sine v gives us plus u sine squared v, which means this is the magnitude of negative u cosine v, u sine v. I should have fixed that throughout, of course. And now it is fixed throughout. Okay, so negative u cosine v, negative u sine v, and then cosine squared v plus sine squared v is 1, so we just end up with a u in the z component. And if we take the square root of the sum of the squares, that's why I wasn't too concerned about those negative signs, I get u squared sine squared v from here, u squared cosine squared v from here, and u squared from here. And uh, then, of course, again, sine squared v plus cosine squared v is 1, so we end up with u squared plus u squared, which is square root of 2 u squared, or simply square root of 2 times u. That should not be too hard to integrate, because now the surface integral is simply the integral of the domain f evaluated on the surface times the area element. And so that'll be the integral from 0 to 1 in u, integral from 0 to pi over 2 in v, f of s of u and v, which would be, because x is u cosine v, we get u cosine v, times y, which is u sine v, times z, which is u, times the area element from here, which is square root of 2 times u, and then we have dv du. And if we sort that out, we end up with a square root of 2 out front. Integrals, of course, integral and bounds stay the same. We have cosine v and sine v right here. We have 1 u, 2 u's, 3 u's, 4 u's, so that's u to the fourth. That ends up being uh, integral 0 to 1 of u to the fourth, integral 0 to pi over 2. Well, cosine v times sine v is 1 half sine 2 v. We've got the sine 2 v here and the 1 half is pulled out. The square root is copied, and so this is, in fact, these two are equal. And now we simply integrate. We get root 2 over 2. Antiderivative of u to the fourth is 1 fifth u to the fifth, taken from 0 to 1. Antiderivative of sine 2v is negative 1 half cosine 2v, quick substitution, from, uh, and it's from 0 to pi over 2, of course. And if we plug that in, we get... Uh, root 2 over 2 times 1 fifth times 1 minus 1 fifth times 0, so times 1 fifth. And then cosine of 2 times pi over 2, that'll be cosine of pi, which is negative 1. So we get plus 1 half minus cosine of minus negative 1 half cosine 0, so minus negative 1 half. So 1 half minus negative 1 half is 1, and so we end up with root 2 over 2 from here, 1 fifth from here, and uh, 1 from here. And that is just root 2 over 10, and that's it. All right, well, that was a lot of computations, and the computations certainly are getting longer. Uh, however, and I, I have seen that before, even, even, even with good students, those longer computations can be a bit intimidating at first, and it can, even if you really, really know what you're doing with calculus, your attention can flag at times and things can go wrong. You've seen me here, unfortunately, drop a couple of negative signs. Do not let that discourage you. Basically, what you want to take away from this presentation is how you set up these surface integrals. You certainly will need the surface area formula for parametric surfaces because you may need to do this for a parametric surface. Whether you choose to remember the formula for for surfaces of the form z equals g of x and y, I leave that to you. And the only other thing you want to take away from here is that after that, it's just a lot of computations. And even if you are a good student for computations, if you really know how to handle computations, just because they're getting longer, they can get a little bit nastier, but the added practice will ultimately get us through that 
also. All right, end of sermon on that one. You've got a good bit of homework with really neat computations to do, and I'll leave you to that. Have a good one.